Okay, let's uh, let's make a start. Thank you, Jonathan, for the music, <clears throat> and uh, everyone who's doing the uh, doing the food. So, if we could have our phones on uh, max maximum volume, yeah, yeah, loud as you can, get them ringtones. That'd just be great. Um, right. So, um, oh, it's quite quite cold this morning. Or... Right on. So uh, let's, uh, let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus to pray for your blessing as we think again of him and his death and his final moments in mortal life. And we pray, Father, that you will bless each of us and open our eyes to him and help, us, help him to be real to us, that we might know that he is real, that he is really there in heaven and he was here on earth suffering the things that we're going to read about and that he loves us and did that for us and will come again for us and we pray that that great day will be soon when finally he will be glorified as he should be for his sake amen, amen. so we're getting up now to the very end of the uh, of the lord's life he's there on the cross coming to the end after this 28 jesus knowing that all things are now finished so that the scripture might be accomplished, he said, I thirst. Nearby was a vessel full of vinegar, so they put a sponge full of the vinegar upon a hyssop stick and held it to his mouth. Well, a hyssop is like a reed, like a bulrush, and it's not more than, let's say, one meter long at the maximum. Right? So they needed this uh, stick, this hyssop stick, to lift up the vinegar to his mouth. So what you can figure from that is that the Lord Jesus was not crucified way, way up in the sky. He was only like, say, one meter above where, where the people were standing. And unfortunately, the idea that is given in Christian sort of art and so forth and churches with great big steeples is that Jesus was crucified way up there and we little people here on earth. No, that's not how it was, because they only needed uh, the, the hyssop stick, like, which as I say can't be more than a metre long, to get the, the sponge of vinegar up to his lips. And of course he, were, he carried his own cross to Golgotha. And I think I mentioned before, that Greek word that's translated cross, it really just means a, a tree trunk. It was a tree trunk that one man could carry on his shoulder. So it was not like a huge, massive, long, you know, 50 metre tall uh, thing. It, 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 was, it was a tree trunk that one man could carry. And so the idea is that the Lord Jesus in his death, in his time of dying, is, was not sort of inaccessible to us, inaccessible to us. He was not way up there. He, was, uh, he is and was a lot closer to us than we, than we might imagine. And when he received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Well, the spirit is the breath. So it was like his last breath inside his lungs and he breathes that out and he knows that that is the end. He gave his spirit. Earlier the Lord Jesus has said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. So in that sense, it would be wrong to say that the Lord Jesus was murdered. He actually, of his own volition, gave his last breath. And that's why in the other Gospels, in Matthew, it says that when the centurion who was watching saw how he died... He said, truly, this was the Son of God. In other words, how Jesus died was unusual. The centurion had watched multiple men die on, on crosses. And as I explained yesterday, people could push back on what was called the sedile, the, the, the seat uh, that was affixed to the, uh, to the upright piece of wood to give themselves some slight relief. And that's why people suffered for hours and their, for, for even days before they died. But Jesus died very quickly. That's why Pilate was surprised he died so quickly. Well, he gave up his spirit, as I say, as an act of the will. 
that he died knowing this is my last breath and he breathed it out and that was his death. As I, as I say, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you've got to put them all together. And then the other, one of the other Gospels, it says that he died and his last words were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Here it says he just gave up his spirit. Well, yes, in the other Gospels it tells you he gave up his spirit in those words. So he had his last breath in his lungs, he knew it was his last breath, and he breathed it out, saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And I think because he was dehydrated, and the whole process of crucifixion would have meant that he was dehydrated, that's why he wanted just some, some moisture so that he could speak those words. That's why he says, I'm, I thirst, can you just give me something to drink? And so <clears throat> the significance, of course, is that in his death, he poured out his spirit. There is more to this than saying, oh yeah, he breathed his last. He died with hands, as I see it, uplifted, like sort of welcoming people to himself, and, and gave out his spirit. Now, yeah, okay, physically, he breathed his last. But what I'm saying is that his spirit is more than that. We receive his spirit. Earlier in John, we read that the spirit was not yet given because he had not been glorified. And I actually think that it's his death on the cross that was his final glory. So, through his death, he gave us the opportunity to have his spirit, and what does that mean? To breathe as he did, to live, to feel, to think, to, to have the same world view, to look at life in the same, with the same eyes that he did. And that is what man needs, to have this ability to think differently, to have a different spirit. Because there, is no, there are no buttons on the side of your head that you can press to reprogram your thinking. You need a new spirit to come into you. And so that is what has been made possible by the Lord's death. That when he died, he gave his spirit, and I'm suggesting that that spirit is available to us when we're baptized. That's why the Lord said earlier in John, that unless a man is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. That's why Peter says to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, Repent of your sins, uh, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, so that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whatever external manifestation that gift may have, be it, you know, people talk of so maxed out on tongues and miracles, all that. that, that that's leaving that question to one side. That's simply the external sign of the fact that you have got this internal transformation, that you have got His Spirit in you. And this is why I urge people to be baptized in water. You know, come back to our place afterwards, get baptized. And you will receive, yeah, like Gary, huh? <laughs> That's Gary's mum. <laughs> Gary got baptized in our bathtub, what was it, two weeks ago? A week ago. Yeah, and, and his mum's just come to say hi. And there was a major change there. Amen. Thank you. So, you see, that is all made possible because he died to give us his spirit. And that testimony there from that, that lady uh, is absolutely amazing. You know? That we baptise Gary. Big change after his water baptism because the spirit of Jesus came into him. And his mum's so impressed she came in to just tell us that and to make that testimony. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely amazing. So, as I say, this meets man at his greatest need. That we, we need a new way of thinking. People say, I'll go to a psychologist, go to a therapist, go to counselling. I say rubbish. But that is not going to give you a new spirit. 
That may help you understand a bit of psychology about your head, sure, but it will not fundamentally change you. The, the fundamental change is from Jesus. But people say to me, oh, I'm not ready to be baptised. I'm in addiction. I'm in this. I'm that. I will do this, that, the other. I'm so weak. Well, it's chicken and egg. You're never going to get right for Jesus. You're not going to come back to me in six months, right and bushy-tailed, and say, you know what, Duncan, I'm now wonderfully clean. I'm all sorted out. I've read the Bible. I'm all ready. Yeah, then you won't want to be baptised. What... <laughs> is needed is that someone like all of us we're all sinners we're all addicted sinners one way or the other is that we just hands up surrender admit our situation and come to the Lord Jesus as our representative and say here I am and he loves us and as I told you yesterday or well, the, the scripture that, that said he that comes to me I will never ever in any way cast out I will not say no to anybody that's the Jesus we're dealing with this is not a church that says, well, young man, let, let's go through your life, you know, um, you, you know, this, that, the other. Oh, no, no, you need to just sort that out. Need to sort that out. Come back and talk to us in a couple of months. I mean, nonsense. That's not the Jesus that we are dealing with. But baptism is into Jesus, not into any, any church or any human club. So that's the significance of him giving his spirit when he died. That we are to receive that spirit. He breathed it out to the uh, small group of disciples that were there. And we saw yesterday that standing by the cross of Jesus, there was um, Mary, the, the wife of Clovis, Mary Magdalene and his mother, and John, the disciple whom he loved. Now, again, the miserable critics, and these people who criticise the Bible are, are totally miserable people. They really are. They say, ah, it says here, verse 25, as you can see, well, you can't see it on the screen, because I, <coughs> I don't know what's happened. Oh, because I'm standing in the front of the projector. Um, that there was standing by the cross of Jesus, his mother, etc., well, the, um, the critics say uh, that's, that's not true because you're not, you weren't allowed to stand uh, by the cross of the crucified. Because if you did, there was a Roman law that said if you stand by the cross of the victim, of, then you can be crucified. There's a Roman law that said that. If you stand by the cross in sympathy for the criminal, then we can pick you up and crucify you straight away. And there were Roman soldiers standing there in front of the cross of Jesus, gambling over his clothes. So, what, how are we to understand this? Again, put the Gospels together. In the other Gospels it says that they were standing, these supporters of Jesus were standing some way away from him. Here in John it says they were standing by the cross. But Jesus says, <coughs> Verse 26, when he sees them standing by the cross, he says to his mother, Woman, behold your son, referring to John. And he says to John, Behold your mother. And the disciple took her to his own home. So they go away from the cross. I think what it was is that they, there, there was Jesus, right? Crucified. There's the soldiers around the cross. And then there's a no man's land, a gap, a space. And then there's the crowd. What had happened is that these women and John and maybe others had come out of the crowd across the no man's land and were standing there defiantly by the cross. And Jesus sees that and he realises that they also might be crucified. So he basically says, no, you don't need to guys, go back. And John takes Mary to his own home. So... The, the, this absolutely speaks to us because we also are in the world, we're in the crowd and we see the cross of Jesus. And yeah, you have got to walk out across the no man's land, across the, the space and identify with him, but he's very gracious. And he basically says to them, thank you, but you don't have to. That's amazing, absolutely amazing grace. So right in his very last moments, he's showing grace and understanding to us. Well, the Jews, verse 31, because it was the preparation day, that is the preparation for the Passover, asked of Pilate that their legs be broken so that they might be taken away. 
Incidentally, I think you can work out from that that the Lord Jesus was killed at the very time, or died, shall I say, he died at the very time the Passover lambs were being killed for the Passover. Because this day when he was crucified was the preparation day. And so they, the Jews say, uh, can ask Pilate, let's just break their legs so that they might be taken away. Therefore the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other that was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they did not break his legs. However, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out of his side. 36. For these things happen so that the scripture might be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture says they shall look on him whom they pierced. So, they pierced his side rather than them breaking the legs. They, they broke the legs of the crucifixion victims while they were still alive just in case they were still alive and could get down from the cross and run away. But Jesus was so obviously dead that they said it's not even worth bothering. Um, they just pierced his side. And this was to fulfill, we are told, the scripture that says, a bone of him shall not be broken. And where is that from? This is from the commands about the Passover that when the Jews kept the Passover and they, they ate of the lamb, they were not to break a bone of the lamb. Right? They were to boil the lamb, not break its bones. And so Jesus is clearly presented as the Passover lamb. And what's the Passover? Well, when Israel were in Egypt and they are rescued out of bondage out of slavery the last plague was that the angel went out and killed all the firstborn sons in Egypt but God said whoever takes a lamb and kills it not breaking a bone of it and paints the blood on their doorposts the angel when he sees that will not kill the firstborn from that house and that's what happened. And so the Jews were told to keep the Passover every year to remember that. But that lamb, that Passover lamb, represented Jesus. And that is why, as you can see, when he was crucified, not a bone of him was broken. And as I've just said, he was, he was killed on the day of preparation, when they were preparing the Passover. He died at the time that the Passover lambs were being killed in preparation for the Passover. So, that's you and me. That we were in Egypt, in bondage in the world. We wanted out. How do I avoid death? How do I get out? Kill the Passover lamb. Paint the blood on your doorposts. And I think what that means is that as Jesus said, a city set on a hill cannot be hid. That there is to be an element of public confession of our faith. That, that we can't be totally like secret Christians. And in any case, we must identify ourselves with the blood of the Lamb. And we do that through the breaking of bread, which we're going to do now. Do you want to pass the... We do that through the breaking of bread. And we do that, of course, through being baptised. Where you go into the water as the symbol of death and resurrection with the Lord Jesus. Now it says a bone of him shall not be broken. When you're baptised, you are baptised into the body of the Lord Jesus. We are, Paul says, of his bones and of his flesh. So we are like the, the bones in the body of Jesus, but the bones of Jesus on the cross, in the crucifixion, were terribly tortured. So his, the whole process of crucifixion was to torture the bones. So yes, we will suffer, but we will not be broken. And that's the thing. Not one of us shall be broken. We will suffer. We are of his bones and of his flesh, but we will suffer. But not one of us shall be broken. That's the thing. So then, 
37, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. That's a prophecy about how when the Lord Jesus comes back, the Jews will see, will see the marks in his body where he was crucified. And when you know that he has got those marks still because after his resurrection, he appeared to the disciples and he says to Thomas, who doubted, he says, give me your finger and put it in my hand because the holes made by the nails were as big as a man's finger. And he says, and give me your hand and put it in my side. Well, the spearhead would have made a hole in the side of the Lord Jesus. That was big enough, not for a finger, but for a man's hand to go into. So even after his resurrection, he still had those marks in him. And so I wonder if, well, I wonder, I mean, it says this, that when he comes back, those who crucified him will see him whom they pierced. So those men who crucified him, how are they going to be there at the last day, seeing these wounds that they put into the side of Jesus? They will be resurrected. They will be resurrected. And so when people think they can just behave how they want, like the people who crucified the Lord Jesus thought they could, you know, behave just how they fancied, how they wanted, yeah, you can, but you will be resurrected and answer for it. That is the whole thing about judgment. That we will be judged for how we have lived. And the fact that we know the Lord means that we are responsible to him. People seem to think that by being baptised into Jesus you become more responsible. Well, I don't think so. It is knowledge that makes you responsible. And so, if we know him, we should be baptised. It's not a case of, oh, I've got to get ready for it, or oh, I don't want the responsibility, you're responsible anyway, because you know him. So then, we take the bread and the, and the cup as a symbol of his, his body and his, his blood. And like the Israelites had to identify with the blood of the Passover lamb, so we want to identify with him. And this is one way that we make that identification. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this bread in which we see the symbol of the body of the Lord Jesus and for the cup in which we see the symbol of his blood. And we pray that truly we might identify with him, all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and that we might take bigger and bigger steps towards identity with him so that we might live with him forever. For his sake. Amen. Well, thank you, Eva and um, Sis, for doing the food. Anyone wants to be baptised, come and talk to me or to Sis. And we can do it this afternoon. But let's, uh, let's just give thanks for the food. Heavenly Father, we again thank you for the food you've given us and for our sisters who prepared it for us. And we pray, Father, that truly we might identify with you and live our life for you and not for ourselves, but for him, for his sake. Amen.